Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I'll uh, discuss a work that is still in progress, unfortunately. So I'll give you the state of the art, but take it for what it is because it's not finished. On the other hand, since this is the first talk, the course uh, app applications, I'll try to give an overview a little bit on the on the on the big issue. So what, what what's happening at CERN? It's happening. So we are somewhere here, and uh, we're taking data aptly. And now uh, we already know that around here, around here, we will get into uh, an upgrade. So we will get into an upgrade phase that will lead us to something like this, which is that the machine will be powered, uh, the beams will be more intense. The result of this would be that every time we get data, we will get more data in a year. Like in a year, we'll get 10 times uh, what we get normally now. The price to pay is that when we do the collision, we get 200 collisions in parallel. So you get 200 images overlapping. You take the screenshot, and you don't know what is what. These more complex things uh, will then require a lot of machine learning in order to disentangle it, and, uh, and uh, a lot of machine learning will go in to try to understand and reconstruct these things. Now, the problem is that we get more data, it's already going to be a challenge to reconstruct them. But once you reconstruct them, you're going to do your precision analysis. The problem you face is that the ultimate goal of your collecting basically 20 times the data we have so far is that you want to probe some new phenomena, comparing some accurate measurement that you do with uh, a, pre a prediction that matches this precision. And this prediction uses a lot Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, one thing is to simulate something like that. One thing is to simulate something like this. So we will need, first of all, more, more Monte Carlo simulation with respect to the data that we have. So you cannot imagine like 1 to 1. You will have to do something like 1 to 10, 1 to 20 maybe. And also, the single events would be much more CPU expensive. Now, if you assume a flat budget, which is already optimistic, I would say, with respect to now, and you extrapolate things, you're basically off by factors. And so you need to find a faster way to do your simulation cheaper that doesn't spoil your precision, because if it spoils the precision, it's like not having it. Now, there are already uh, successful stories about this, so people immediately thought generative models, mainly GANs, I have to say so far. Uh, have been proposed as a possible solution to this problem. Uh, there are already very successful proof of principle. We saw one in the previous session. I think this is going to be the subject of the uh, next talks. But I, I like a little bit to explain uh, the problem. So how does this work? We have a, a full set of software that starts from what we call it, now that the, the language is a little bit different. So the generation for us is when you start from basically a data card, the txt file that says what you want to generate. And then there is a code typically written by theorists that put the physics in and actually simulate the collisions of the protons and the particles that get out. Then we have the simulation step, which is done injecting the output of this into a library which we call Giant. This library has all the physics that we know about the interaction of known particles, electrons, protons, and whatever you're made of with the material of our detector. So you open Giant, you specify the geometry of your object, and then uh, you say this particle is coming in, and Giant gives you a realistic uh, outcome of uh, the interaction of this particle with your detector. And this is the part which is extremely consuming. Then, uh, uh, so this is basically today, this workflow, then what happens is that at this point you have uh, an image which is like the one that you normally take, you do the same thing you do with normal data, which is you run a reconstruction of all these dots, of all the sensors that you have that gives you the particles, and then you apply some physics selection, some physics analysis that gives you your result. The big steps are this and this, which are more or less one-to-one -one these days. And the simulation itself, so, so these two steps, is something you need to run on all your, simula on your, your simulated Monte Carlo events, plus this step you have to run it on the data. You don't need to do this on the data. Uh, now, 
the idea is that when you when you when you do the 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 guns you can imagine that you you basically jump to this step so this image is an example you have a particle coming in and rather than calling this library giant you will call a generative model the generative model will give you the outcome of the interaction of this particle coming in with the detector and then you will plug it in and pass it to the next step so this way you go from the list of generated particles in the collision directly to the input of your reconstruction, skipping this uh, CPU intensive step. With GANs you can do more actually, you can actually jump directly here, because you can imagine that your, your, your reference data set is not the outcome of the simulation, but is actually the outcome of the reconstruction, and this way you can do, you can do the step through. And these are actually tested, there is the paper no, once you will get the PDF, if you click on the picture, you'll see the link to the paper. There is a paper that came out recently that uh, used uh, uh, CMS open data sets. So CMS, is the detector I'm part of, the experiment I'm part of is putting every year online the data set collected five years before. So you have access to the full data set. And then uh, with these people were actually our CMS people. So they knew what, a little bit how to handle this data. What they did was to generate, uh, to, to train a gun to give in output a, a particle jet, which is a sp the spray of particle that comes out from radiation of quarks and gluons, uh, directly. So you get the image of the full jet back after the reconstruction after the, the, the reconstruction of the full uh, list of particles. So you don't get the single individual list of particles, but you get the collective effect of these particles which are nearby in sort of a cone. And this then, they use these these the, the, this distributions to compute expert features which are typically used to do an identification of which kind of jet it was. Did it start from a quark, did it start from a gluon? And uh, you see that it's not perfect, but it's pretty, much, it's pretty much good. So here, for instance, it doesn't work very well, but it does for these kind of other features, which actually aren't the main features used. So somehow, this is showing how we could go through the full, uh, we could basically skip the full workflow and jump directly here. It gives to analyst something which is analysis ready. Uh, at least in this kind of scenarios in which you have to handle these high-level objects that you can describe collectively without needing individual constituents inside. Now, this motivated a little bit of study, which is starts from a, little, a, a few other considerations on how typically analysis goes, the elicited analysis goes. So, as I said, uh, there is this big load of CPU. Unfortunately, the CPU is not the big part of the problem. Storage is the big part of the problem. So where do you put this data? Then a typical LHC event takes a megabyte of disk. And if you have an accurate simulation of all the detector, it takes a megabyte per event. And now, this, this consumes tape, which is relatively cheap, but consumes disks, because eventually, if you want to use it, you cannot start your analysis from tape, and this is expensive. And so, if you now scale this thing up, the amount of storage that you will need might be uh, too much for you to handle at flat budget. On the other hand, the experience of these first 10 years tell us that uh, we don't really need one megabyte of data to analyze. So what we actually do is that we take this megabyte of data, which is centrally analyzed once, and then uh, you write order of hundreds expert features out of this that then you write in some compact uh, data format that takes a few kilobytes, what CMS called them nano EODs, for instance, because this is the smallest version of something, which is the smallest version of our default data format, which is analysis object data for that, I think it is, AOD. So the point there is that at the end of the day, an actual analysis uses a, a few handful of expert features. The point is that which expert features are used depends on the analysis. So the idea is, can I actually imagine a, a, a generative model that gives me directly, that populates this n-dimensional PDF of analysis of expert features, knowing that 
What I, what I would obtain would be analysis specific, which means that they, uh, my, my office uh, colleague might be doing something else, he might need another generative model. The advantage, on the other hand, is that this analysis specific uh, generative model could be run on demand and would basically avoid the CPU because it's extremely CPU easy once you train it, and particularly it will avoid the storage because you would store directly the few kilobytes without having to store the one megabytes everywhere, anywhere. So, and this is where this uh, work in progress that I was mentioning starts. So we have thought about two possible applications. One is basically a, some sort of data augmentation technique where you start from a subset, so some data set that was generated through the classical way, and then you train a generative model that learns the distribution of the n quantities that you care at reconstruction level after you apply your selection and basically gives you back that knowledge of that PDF that then you can use to, to, to generate new versions of this. It's like generating new faces out of a data set, a, a data set of faces. The, the other strategy instead is uh, what we, in our language we call a fast simulator, which is that you learn the function so you, you describe all this process as some smooth function that goes from your generator level to your reconstructed level, but again, you limit yourself to the n quantities that you care about, which of course you can also compute from first principle before the detector. So here what you're learning is the detector response function times the reconstruction response function times the whatever selection you apply to scheme your data. Now, uh, in our case, what we did uh, in the data set, we tried to emulate this full uh, workflow, except that we did it with, uh, uh, let's say, independent libraries. So the detector was not the full JM thing that I told you about, but it was uh, a parametric description of our detector, which I think is good enough for this study. So what we did, as I told you, we start from some card that says which physics process we want, we generate uh, with this library, the collision itself, this gives us the general level quantities that we can compute. Then we pass it through our detector simulator, this gives us the reconstruction quantity, and then from, he from here we compute our expert features. So we compute the expert feature at this level and this level, and this gives us the two data sets that we want. We simulated something like 2015-16 LHC conditions, so 13 TV collisions, energy, and 20 simultaneous interactions at the same time, not 200. And we got something like 2 million events of, uh, of uh, daimion events for those who care. And this is the kind of, uh, of uh, the expert features that one will look at. It's very difficult to read, but these are basically the momenta of the two leptons, the missing energy in the event, some jet PT, the invariant mass of the two leptons, and the two lines uh, represent the generated the generator level and the reconstruction level for the same quantities. You see that for some of these quantities, that there is a very minimal difference because the detector is very good in reconstruct those quantities. For some others, it's a completely different story. Uh, and you see here the residuals that uh, basically summarize what I just said. Um, so the first thing, the Rico to Rico. Uh, so we, we basically, the idea of the network in this case is again a gun. So we have a generator discriminator. The generator takes as input some random noise and uh, generates this n-dimensional array of uh, in expert features that you compare with the real ones into discriminator. And uh, you have uh, your yes or no answer in discriminator, but you also add the RS stabilization, the regression of the MLL, of the invariant mass of the two leptons. Uh, this was implemented in uh, Keras with TensorFlow, on, uh, we're running on uh, our own uh, single card GPU, but then also tested uh, at CSCS. We got a GPU uh, um, a project uh, accepted for some GPU hours there, and we, we, we tried also some larger scale training. So this is just for the record, the two models, the generator discriminators. And then here we go to the details of the training. So the loss function itself is usual sum of the cross entropy, and then you have this uh, uh, regression, MSC for the regression of the invariant mass <coughs> of the two leptons with some coefficients to weight it down. 
so as you can imagine, this is like a plain gun. It's quite unstable. Uh, we tried W guns, it didn't really help a lot, so we're still seeing that the system itself uh, is extremely fragile. You have this problem, which is very well known, of the of the the collapse uh, of the of the of the network and also the difficulty in basically reproduce the results that we get. So and eventually we decided that just using the loss function as a guidance would not be enough. So what we tried to do is to establish some level of uh, some parametric uh, uh, numerical evaluation of uh, what with the sound generator would say, okay, what it's, the sound makes sense or the image look like a reasonable image. We tried a little bit cook, to cook something, which is a statistical test on what were com was coming out, mainly Kolmogorov, Smirnov on some of the quantities, but also some global quantity that was taking the 19 features and was basically looking at the dispersions of the uh, reconstruction versus the real one. Now, uh, the idea is to somehow s make this approach more solid, uh, including more like standard distance um, definitions within PDFs, like uh, the KL divergence, the mover distance, and so on, and try to preserve this global uh, concept. Now, what we tried is that we tried the global itself, it's not enough. We tried this exclusive Kolmogorov test, it's not enough. We really see that, so for instance, if you just put this in, you get these variables well reproduced, but somehow some others are completely uh, messed up. So we think that we need the two, the two sets of uh, statistical scores to be taken into account. Now, this is difficult to see, but basically using the statistical scores, we can actually rank the models as our training goes. So we have different trainings at different starting points, and depending on the starting points, we get different results. That's the, the unfortunate uh, fact. And then we look at the function of the epochs, and we evaluate these statistical scores, and then we rank the models. We do see that in the top uh, few percent, these models have different statistical scores, but by eye, you cannot really perceive any difference. We see that some variables are well reproduced while we have uh, issues with the, with the jets, for instance. We have the issues with the jets because sometimes in our data set there are no jets. So there you had to zero pad, so you need to learn the spike for the events that have no jets. Most likely, a better way to handle this would be to split the, training, the data sets into different jet multiplicity and to generate the guns one by one because in any case we know the relative compositions of events with one, two, three, and four jets. Uh, for the other task, uh, the situation is a little bit different. So as I said, you want to start with the, your n uh, features, and you want to just learn a function, which is a function n to n. Uh, you could do this with an autoencoder. Uh, what we did instead was uh, still we tried with GAN. The autoencoder is, uh, is uh, happening after. In the case of the GAN, you start from your gen data, of you go through the, the usual reconstruction uh, path, so you go through this way, or you inject this into a generator, so you condition this generator with this initial data. At this level, you could add random noise or not. We wanted actually to learn a deterministic function, so we didn't use extra, extra noise in. And then you get your random measure distribution, and then you get your discriminator and that says yes or no. Now, doing this, uh, we, we, we follow this paper here that somehow branded something which is already discussed in these other papers, the fact that when you go into your training and you do the two steps, so you freeze the, gen the discriminator and you train the generator and the other way around, in between, you stick in um, a regression step that try to regress the and try to regress uh, this against that. So somehow you are injecting some supervision into the problem, which works well for those quantities that I showed you before for which the difference between Gen and Rico is small because you are basically learning a very narrow local fu smearing function. While it doesn't work well for the others. So the first step that we did was, uh, okay, this again is the architecture of the models. We simplify the problem, so we focus only on the four momenta of this object, so it's five degrees of freedom after you take out all the 
symmetries of the problem and, and uh, in f the rotation in phi and the fact that once you have the momentum, you know the mass as an, is a number, so you, the energy is not an independent degree of freedom. So you reduce your dimensionality to five, forgot some of the variables, and at this level we do see that this works okay in the sense that the, the training itself, this, this, uh, this regression step is actually helping the, the, the generator to get to a stable uh, performance and the training history is a little bit more well behaving and eventually you get something like that where on the other hand you see that the, the typical agreement is still within uh, let's say 10-20 percent. The real reason here is that we're showing the ratio while the actual problem here seems to be a shift. Uh, while here you see that everything works well and then on the very far on the tails things converge. So somehow this would be analysis ready at least because when you do standard model measurements you only care about the core of this distribution but there are still many things to understand. And, uh, and, and then uh, when you try to predict uh, out of these quantities that you, uh, you train the GAN for, you, you try to predict functions of this quantity, you see that the behavior is not, uh, is not bad. So here there is, again, a shift uh, which comes directly from this shift. But uh, this is something that we think we can cure with a little bit more effort. This comes out pretty much OK, which is the mass of the lepton, which is a busy delta function. Uh, so the approach is promising. What we know already is that we're seeing some limitation when uh, this goes into uh, trying to deal with features that from Gen to Rico, they are very, very different. We think that the, the, the ultimate approach there would be to use this MS GAN trick for the quantities for which we expect it to work and so basically run the regression on a subset of the features Why we let the gun do the rest of its job for the others. But we didn't have time yet to try that, so we'll see. Now, to finish, I wanted to mention something that uh, has nothing to do with generator, but uh, the nice thing of machine learning is that sometimes you solve a problem and then you're solving a completely different problem with basically the same technique. The fact that now if I invert this arrow and I try to go from Rico to Gen, I have an unfolding mechanism. An unfolding is something in our field is very interesting, simply because we do measurements after our detector effects, but our theorists compute things before our generator. Theorists will live here, we live here. So, or we give them a simulation of our detector, and then they can go from what they calculate to what we see, or we take our results and we try to bring them back. To what, and this is something that we do typically with unfolding. But unfolding is a very uh, tricky business. So there are several techniques that in our fields have been adopted at standard. And now our idea is that this could be, uh, guns could be a way to go through unfolding. Now the workflow is different. So now you always start from gen, but you're here. And now you do the usual chain, so from gen to Rico in order to create the Rico data set that then you inject into the generator. Here we tried some, so we have two applications. We also try to inject some noise into the, the generator. Uh, and then uh, you get your end features at Rico level, uh, at gen level, predicted from the Rico level. So going through this arrow. And then you compare with the actual <coughs> gen you started from. And again, you trick saying yes or no. Now things here, sort of work. So it is still true that with the MS trick, things are pretty stable. The agreement is less satisfactory that with the, with, the, with the fast simulation application, but still it's promising. And we think that with some extra work on that, we could actually make it work. And this would be nice because it could allow to generalize these unfolding uh, techniques to much larger dimensionality space. So in conclusion, we see already now that uh, generating large samples of simulated LHC events uh, uh, is now and will be more in the future a major problem. Uh, and several studies have demonstrated already that, uh, that uh, GANs in particular, but I would say generative models in general, could be used uh, to speed up this process. So this would definitely, I think this is unquestionable, that we already see now, if we go and compute how much time it takes uh, to do the inference phase with this model, this would clearly alleviate our problem. But this means that we need to uh, 
uh, push up the precision of these uh, of these techniques at the level of uh, percentage and sub percentage in order to be used on a high high precision physics we want to do after 2025. So what we try to study in this case is something that really focuses on application uh, application specific uh, generation. So try to not to focus on the big problem, but just on the specific order of 10 features that people typically handle in one analysis. And as I said, since the kind of features depend on the analysis, you will basically need to have many networks uh, replacing one big uh, network that generates the single dots. There is, of course, uh, this advantage that you have to generate more models. The advantage is that you strip <coughs> completely the processing chain, and you also save the storage and not the CPU. So, and then I show you two main applications. One that starts from noise and tries to give you a reconstructed event, and one that goes from the gen to the ego and some to model the response function of your detector. The ultimate goal of this, of course, I and mean, if we are to, like, to set the dream, would be that you have uh, a super duper gun or autoencoder in 2025 that gives you back the 100 uh, features that people take in the end to post, and then with one gun you serve basically 80% of your analysis. I'm not sure we'll ever get there, but of course I wanted to set the dream uh, when it starts to work on something. I mean, just already identifying these 100 variables was considered a dream at the beginning of the LHC, so already <laughs> half of the dream is there. Um, in general, this could also be beneficial for other applications. I'll show you the example of the unfolding. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Are there questions? Yes. Just to clarify this unfolding, can I think of it as an, something like inverting generator? To, to it's go basically, you have it, it's, it's, so you have to imagine that your fun, your, your full process is a smooth function that goes from the particles as they come in the collision to what you see. And this is the function, the inverse function, yes. And typically, this, the unfolding is something that you do on the expert features. It's extremely, it's explicitly done on expert features. Never seen someone, so no, I know that someone is trying to invert the response of the function, but that's for another application to actually learn what's going on. For the unfolding application, typically you have your analysis, like you're doing a maximum likelihood fit on n quantities. You extract some, you extract some parameter. You want to give this parameter before the detector effects when you measure it after the detector effects. And so what you do is that you invert the function of the detector effects on these three quantities that you fit it for. OK, cool, thanks. Other question? I've just been wondering if this is in any way related to uh, LHC at home, the packages I can download at home on my PC? No, it's not related to LHC. Maybe one okay. day we will do LHC training at home. So you're not planning to, at the moment to use this built approach for that? No, the, the LHC at home uh, package is actually try to answer to the same CPU needs in another way, which is to use the CPU of people. And uh, I think it's a very interesting idea, but it doesn't, I mean, even if it becomes a, a substantial part of our CPU power, which is not the case, uh, still the storage problem will stay. Not only, I think for to actually doing training reliably in something like LHC at home, you need to think smart how you're going to do the scheduling of the jobs and the communications between the different. Uh, I think that the, this LHC, so the, the, there are there are several of these at home LHC related packages. The one which is specific of the accelerator, I think it was used. Well, out of the the one for the collabor experimental collaboration, I'm not sure that the, for the moment we are still at the test. Yes, simulation workflows from, I think, Atlas has one, CMS has one, but uh, I don't know how much w the outcome of that is used. I think this is very, very experimental. Again, it's a completely different uh, way to solve the problem, which is you s keep doing what you're doing, but in a more, less reliable uh, hardware environment. 
So just to clarify, uh, when you mentioned the zero spike uh, at the generated data yes. because of padding, so to bypass this, were you referring to use some kind of condition or use like no, I was a thinking, model? I was saying to fragment your problem into, let's say that you have a data set with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 jets, okay? Rather right, than assuming that you always have four jets and do zero padding when you don't, you separate this in one, two, three, and four jet samples. You train them. You don't have zeros to generate them. And then what you do is that since you know the DND and jet distribution, when you are using it in inference, you would basically uh, <laughs> generate the number of jets according to the known distribution, and then you infer from the corresponding function all the other features. It's a, it's a trick. Of course, it would be nice to fi actually fix the problem, but it's a trick that, it's also a trick that actually increased your, your, your training resources need, but uh, for sure that works. Then how it is generalizable? There are other kinds of consideration like that. For instance, in the specific problem that we have, we also have the problem that the charge is a discrete quantity. So we play trying to make the charge float and then you take the integer part at the end. But of course, another thing that you notice is that you have half are positive, half are negative, you can toss a coin. <laughs> but this is a, a problem specific solution and it's, we didn't go that way because we wanted to show the, the general strategy. But of course, in a, real, in a real situation where you're trying to do something specific for your analysis, if you know the physics of the data you're trying to generate, there are many of these shortcuts that you can take to actually get rid of the problems. So there are the physics tricks you can play, but you cannot write a proof of principle with, the, with this application-specific tricks. That would not be the way to go. Are there more? No? Okay. So, well, thank you, Maurizio. Thanks. Yeah.